Honestly, I've been waiting for Licorice the Coil to get less good. <laughs> and every single episode, it keeps doing good. Episode 4 of Licorice the Coil was absolutely fantastic. And I think it's really around character writing. This writer knows how to do characters. It was so nice because with episode 3, what we really had was Takina realizing she had a place to be. She had a home to be at. Chisato literally told her, do whatever you want. But... Give this a shot. Try this out. Try this cafe out. Try these people out. See if you enjoy it. And if you don't, you can go back to the DA. You can go back to the previous life that you're seeking so much. You can find that opportunity to sneak in there. But with episode four, what it's doing is it's taking it for that moment, that that chisel. Like, Chisato has made a chip in Takina's armor. She now has a gap that they can work at. And in episode four, we really had that moment where Takina... Just have a casual moment with Chisato. Have this little date going out and doing stuff and enjoying time together. And then having that moment where Takina finally opens up. Like that that little crack finally just spreads. And you see this other side of Takina. That side that wants to enjoy life. Not only that, but having a brief moment where you have her really kind of trying to help Chisato get over something. And I thought that that was a huge character moment for Takina. We're not really seeing Chisato change much other than seeing more about her. But really, the character growth is in Takina. Takina becoming a little bit uh, infected by Chisato's nature. And the way they played that out episode 4 felt so natural. It felt like a true character moment. And like I said, huge credit to the writer here. I'm, I'm more and more going, dang it, why have I not watched Bento yet? <laughs> now granted, I think Bento is more comedy driven. But at least I'm seeing, again, how creative this writer is because this feels so very natural. But yes, episode four was fantastic. Really did love it. <laughs> I love opening up this whole thing with kind of a callback to the previous episode, honestly, because Chisato, as they're playing this VR game, which was funny because they were actually playing against Fuki and Sakura on there, and both sides were angry at playing this person online because, yes, their name was Chisato and their name was Fuki. So they're literally mad about the names and they're competing. So they don't really realize it's the two of them. But yes, at some point, Takana doing a flip and Chisato seeing something. <laughs> I love this because she immediately goes to check Takana's underwear and they are boxers. And we come to find out that, yes, Takana asked Mika for some advice about clothes because she no longer has the DA to handle everything, I'm assuming. And yes, his he says boxer because, I mean, he wears boxers. So it turns this whole thing of Chisato dragging Takina to go buy clothes. Which was funny because, like I said, it technically is a callback to episode two. Because we had Takina changing in the change room. And then she overheard Chisato talking about going to get her license again. And immediately Takina opens the door, still changing. And it's like, well, technically she was wearing boxers. <laughs> And technically, she probably was not wearing anything up here. But still, it was kind of funny to have sort of a callback. But I love how <laughs> when Chisato leaves, like, we're going to go buy Pansu. As she's leaving, she says, oh, make sure to wear casual clothes. And Takana's like, I don't have anything. So she immediately turns to Mika again. <laughs> Do you have casual clothes? And Mika immediately, like, raises his head like, oh, crap, here we go again. Like, he doesn't even want to get involved anymore. It was just, again, these character moments are so perfect. They're so well. It's got a little comedy in there. And it's just goofy and natural feeling. But yes, this leads into the date though, where they go out and they try out outfits. So we get a nice little kind of change of different types of outfits for Takina. Which again, which is honestly overall with the entire series what I really like. I think this, this team, somebody in there has a sense of fashion. Because there's a lot of different showing of the characters in different outfits. In the OP, there's in the, the title cards, the break in the middle of the episode. They have these really great outfits for the character. And so we get a little more of a show off of that. But yes, eventually going to buy Pansu, where <laughs> Takina's like, well, let me see yours. <laughs> and she's like, I wasn't really expecting to have to show you. Uh, it was so cute. Uh, such a great little moment. And yes, eventually they go to the aquarium, which I think this is where we get the nugget of the character developments between Chisato and Takina. Like I said, we had in episode three a really pinnacle point in the characters where we have that chiseling of Takina's armor and really allowing her to grow as a character to something more natural and enjoying life. And I think this is that point where that finally broke. Having this little kind of casual conversation between the two of them, and it really came into Sato's at least showing a little bit more of her sides. 
as talking as wanting to know more about Chata. Why do you use non-lethal? What is so, you know, why do you do this? Did Mika make those bullets for you? Did he use them at the tower? And it's always been from Chata's vantage point, which we've kind of got a hint from from the previous episodes, is that she doesn't want, to, yeah, they, they're your enemy today, but they're not your enemy tomorrow. She's like, I don't like that idea of taking away somebody's time. It bothers her. The idea that somebody has the potential of being 60 years old, but you take away 30 years of it by ending them in 30, that's something that bothers her. And even more, she doesn't like that about bad guys. It's like, if, so if you don't like killers, don't be the killer. And I think it was a really uh, genuine way of thinking about it. This is something that bothers her and she doesn't want to see that. So this turns into a whole <laughs> goofy conversation about her thinking Chasato, it was more than that, that she was this mysterious being. Which turns into kind of a discussion about what drives Chasato. What is she seeking? And apparently it is somebody that is important to her. She's looking for somebody and it all ties into this necklace, this little owl emblem, the Allen Institute, I believe it is. It's a, something that is given to geniuses out there. Something that shows that you're something special, which... Brings up the joke about what is special about you. Obviously, I'm a model. <laughs> no, that can't be it. But yeah, apparently somebody gave her this medal. And she wants to find that person and just simply thank them. Which, yes, as everybody was kind of predicting, ends up being Yoshi. <laughs> Yoshi is over here talking to Mika. I like it that they didn't really kind of drag that out. I, I like that they've already kind of revealed this. So it's not like one of those, okay, is it obvious secret? But yes, basically have this conversation between Mika and Yoshi where they are talking about the fact that once he did give her this and that Mika's telling him, look, you are, she's looking for you. Why don't you just show her? And yes, it seems like Yoshi reveals this point that she was like a beneficiary and that the Allen Institute kind of forbids them from being able to contact recipients of their support. So even though <laughs> Mika's like, but you showed up at the cafe, it seemed like he still wanted to see her. Which again, I'm still assuming that Yoshi is her father and not just a supporter, but it does technically hit on why on paper, I guess, he did give her that support. They support anybody that's a genius, even if that genius is in killing, even though she uses non-lethal. <laughs> But no, going back to the scene before this, they're having this whole kind of segment where she's talking about how she wants to find this person and thank them. It was really great right here. This was a pinnacle part of talking a story because this is the point where she realizes Chisato's talking about something that's kind of heavy. It's something that weighs on Chisato's heart. She wants to find this person that gave her this, this person that was her supporter. And to break that ice, Takina actually goes out <laughs> and makes a little fish gesture and it was like it was so out of character like it was her coming out of that comfort zone that she has this very kind of quiet and to herself self she actually went out there and technically humiliated herself just to bring Chisato out of this deep moment and I think that was like a great moment for her really finally seeing her smile seeing her do something goofy all for the benefit of Chisato no benefit to herself and like I said that's technically like that great writing. It's nothing humongous. It's nothing her saving her from a burning building. This is as simple as her just being there, them enjoying time together and growing together. And yes, Chisato slowly, slowly infecting Takina into enjoying life. And it even adds more to it at the very end when you have this brief moment where Takina finally giggles. And it was such a, it was such a goofy giggle and I loved it. It was, it was so natural and so goofy. This whole episode was just fantastic though. The, the interaction between Chisato and Takina were just fantastic. And yes, technically getting the reveals of Chisato what she's seeking. It's nothing huge and grandiose, but I'm sure it's going to be significant going forward. Like I said, it does seem like Yoshi cares for Chisato, obviously like a parental figure. At the same time, she did gain something from this person supporting her. Maybe she didn't have anything and that that support allowed her to grow. Additionally, on the other side, Yoshi is, does he care for her or is he just benefiting her because she's a killer? He wants to use her. And again, my whole assumption here is that he's slowly puppeteering in the background to bring these girls together, but for what reason? What is coming up that he's going to need them? Is he going to be doing it for nefarious reasons or is it for a good thing? Does he not trust the DA? Does he think the DA is doing wrong? And does he want a different corporation to take them down or at least replace them? But yes, outside of this, we did get the introduction of Kirito. It sounded like Kirito. <laughs> we have Kirito, the madman who's trying to essentially rebalance the world. He feels like the licorice has unbalanced the world, I guess between crime and not crime. I'm not sure what his balance is, but he did decide that he wanted to bring a bunch of people and do a big uh, attack on this subway. 
And yes, the subway's full of Skullgirls that are all trying to take them down, but then he blows it up. I don't know. They didn't really mention if the girls inside there got taken out, but he most all of his men got taken out. And it does seem like he gets contacted by Robota, which again was the guy that worked with uh, Yoshi to try to take down Kurumi. And Robota says, you know, use my brains and your power and we can work together. But this guy's like, no, I'll just make a bigger, I'll make a bigger boom. Um, that's all I need. Something that is going to essentially bring to light that the Likurus cannot cover up. I'll be curious to see if he is somehow tied in with the tower. He looks at the tower at the end, but, or maybe it was whoever was involved with the tower. Maybe it was somebody that he knew. But yeah, overall, really fantastic episode. Love the boxer stuff. <laughs> I think the boxer stuff was a nice way of kind of, again, getting into a more personal interaction between the characters. I loved how she tried them on at the very end. <laughs> she got caught wearing them so that she gets pulled into the public and shown everybody. <laughs> it was great. And yes, talk, check Takina's again. They're really cute. Really fun, though. I think the boxer thing was really well handled. I mean, yes, the, they didn't really show anything, which I think is tasteful, I guess. I It's one of those things where I don't mind if they show anything, but at the same time, it makes it a little more difficult to suggest to certain people when they do have, yes, an entire episode of showing Ponsu. <laughs> I forgot. She's like, which one of these lingeries is best for gunfight? She's like, oh yeah, of course there's lingerie for gunfight. No, there's not. <laughs> Again, I love the writing. The writing's so good in this show. It's so good. But anyways, Gosh, 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 gosh. That's my thoughts on episode four of the Kudusi Coil. Still going good. Eventually, I'm going to have a week where I don't have anything to talk about, but this this writer is just so dang good. So, hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, if you did, make sure to hit that like button down below. Comment. Let me know what's thought of the episode. If it's, if it's still working for you, do you love that chemistry as much as I do? Subscribe to the channel if you've not already so you can get all my content. I do news, reviews, first impressions. If it's anime, it's pretty much here. Additionally, if you want to support the channel more, we have a Patreon link, a tips link, and a super thanks button down below. Definitely appreciate everybody that does, and y'all take care.